This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. It's a new month, and today we'll begin a series titled Deadly Therapy. It's human nature to want to create change in your life, whether it's to form a new habit, tame an addiction, or just live a happier and more peaceful life. Most of us have sought healing in some form at least once in our lives. That may mean healing from past trauma or current health or psychological challenges. We may look for help and support with changing or improving our lives through various resources. Churches, self-help groups and programs, therapists, etc. are all ways we may approach these journeys of transformation. In the first episodes in this series, I'll detail cases of people who sought help from experts, but rather than receiving healing and transformation, their journeys came to an abrupt and deadly end. In this first chapter, you'll hear how a self-described success coach and guru required his followers to perform increasingly more extreme mental and physical challenges, all in the pursuit of enlightenment. Blind devotion to him and his teachings would lead to the deaths of several of his followers. This is the case of James Arthur Ray. In 2006, The Oprah Winfrey Show was the top-rated daytime talk show in television history. It was common knowledge that even being mentioned on the hit show would lead to maximum exposure and could catapult a person into celebrity status. Oprah's Book Club, a segment on the show where Oprah recommended her favorite novels, had turned previously unknown works into bestsellers. So when Oprah dedicated an entire episode to the documentary video The Secret, it was no surprise that a firestorm erupted with the public clamoring to know more about the people portrayed in the film. The Secret, a documentary film and companion book, was a self-help program created by Rhonda Byrne, an Australian television writer and producer. The program was basically a success guide based on the law of attraction a New Age belief that claimed a person's thoughts manifest into their reality. If you think positively, the belief goes, positive things will happen. If you hold on to negative thoughts and emotions, then you, in essence, block good things from showing up in your life. In the film The Secret, several New Age teachers, philosophers, and gurus lay out the concept of ask, believe, and receive in short segments where each teacher is featured sharing their own understanding of the concept as well as recounting their personal experiences with the Law of Attraction. Oprah asked a few of these teachers to appear on her episode about The Secret. Jack Canfield was the author of the best-selling Chicken Soup for the Soul books, who traveled the country with his inspirational message of hope and faith. Dr. Michael Beckwith went from being an imprisoned drug dealer to the leader of the Agape Spiritual Center in Los Angeles, with a congregation of over 10,000 members. Lisa Nichols wrote books and made appearances as a motivational speaker for young people. And James Arthur Ray was a self-made man who said he went from an awkward boy to a successful business owner earning millions by teaching others about the law of attraction and helping them to live their best lives. After the episode aired, sales of the DVD and companion book skyrocketed. Oprah's audience was so hungry for more of The Secret's teachings that she invited both James Arthur Ray and Dr. Beckwith back the following week for a second appearance on the show. Ray, who'd spent a decade trying to get his message out to the world with varying degrees of success, now became so popular he began selling out stadiums full of people eager to sit before him and learn his secrets of success. James Arthur Ray, who'd come from humble origins in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was now a worldwide sensation and a very wealthy man. James Arthur Ray was born on November 22, 1957. His father was a Navy man, and the family was stationed in Honolulu, Hawaii, when Ray came into the world. Soon after, however, his father was discharged from the service, and the family moved to Iowa and then Tulsa, Oklahoma. There, Ray Sr. became a Protestant minister at the Red Fork Church of God. Ray was proud of his father, who spent his life helping people, but he also saw a problem. His father and mother would go out of their way for others, he later wrote, upholding the word of God and working very hard, 
but the family barely made ends meet financially. To Ray, this was not right, and he didn't understand why God wouldn't provide financially and make things easier for those who served him. But instead of answering his question, Ray said his father only led him to scripture, which said, It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than a rich man to enter heaven. This was unacceptable to young Ray. Instead, he came to believe that being poor was in itself a sin, and he vowed to become a wealthy man. Ray graduated from high school in 1976 and went on to attend community college for two years. At the same time, he threw himself into a punishing fitness routine that transformed him from a skinny teen to a young man who placed in amateur bodybuilding competitions. Ray was a hard worker and gave 110% to everything he pursued. He was a workaholic, he said, and didn't have time to spend the money he was socking away. Finally, he decided to reward himself by purchasing a motorcycle, something he'd always wanted. But he ended up wrecking the motorcycle and sustained serious injuries in the accident. While he was recovering, he realized that he'd spent a lot of time working on his health and his finances, but not enough on developing his mind. Through his studies, he came to understand that mental blocks, including areas learned from parents and others, self-limiting beliefs and insecurities, can hold a person back from achieving their goals. He began reading books on psychology and philosophy to learn how to overcome these limitations in his own life. Ray was hired by Southwest Bell as a telemarketer and moved into a sales position and then began managing AT&T stores. He did so well in sales that he was promoted to a trainer at the AT&T School of Business in Atlanta. In his mid-twenties, he entered into his first serious relationship and jumped into a marriage that he didn't really want. Ray would explain that because he'd been raised to believe having sex before marriage was a sin, he was brainwashed into the idea that he should marry because it was the right thing to do. Of course, the marriage was short-lived, and after just two years, the couple divorced. Ray and his wife had purchased a home together, and as the marriage was crumbling, so was their financial stability. Their house was foreclosed on in 1987. This was exactly what Ray had always feared a life of mediocrity, and living from paycheck to paycheck. He wanted more, a lot more, from himself and for his future. He now decided to go all in to create a better life. AT&T encouraged its managers and sales teams to incorporate the teachings of Stephen R. Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People into their training. Ray took this program to heart and then sought out even more books, workshops, and seminars that taught the steps to success and financial freedom. He took everything he learned and began fashioning it into a personalized program that he followed religiously. Ray began offering a coaching program to others made up of his own success principles. He launched his first business, calling it Quantum Consulting Group. He taught his clients time management and team building. Later, he would expand his coaching program and move it to San Diego. He renamed the business Ray Transformation Technologies and later rechristened it again to James Ray and Associates. It was still a solo venture with some part-time help. In California, he attended a Tony Robbins seminar and liked what he saw. Robbins, who began his motivational speaking career at the age of 17, had a high-energy, in-your-face style that was still positively focused and very engaging. He was at the top of the self-help game in the early 2000s when Ray became a follower, and he incorporated some of Robin's style into his own programs. Ray began receiving invitations to present motivational speeches at multi-level marketing events like Amway and Herbalife conventions. Most of his keynote speeches were geared towards business success, and only later would he begin incorporating the spiritual aspects that would become synonymous with his programs. He had modest success earning money from speaking fees in his mentoring and coaching programs, but the tech crash, devastating to the U.S. economy and felt most deeply in California, brought his business to a standstill. He began living off of credit cards and going deeper in debt, trying to keep afloat. He still believed that his program was sound and that he could help himself and others with the principles he espoused. Ray took a break from building his business. He couldn't sell $1,000 seats to his seminars to people who were unemployed or underemployed. He took this time instead to immerse himself in spirituality and in meditation. 
He claimed to have studied under a Peruvian shaman, as well as a wise kahuna in Hawaii. He wrote of experiencing his aha moment at the top of Mount Sinai while on a vision quest. It was here where Ray said he intuitively received a set of universal laws, much like Moses, that would make up the crux of his new philosophy and teachings. His program of success, called Harmonic Wealth, was born. He would write an account that detailed his journey and laid out the principles of his program in a book of the same name. While the tech crash and economic downturn caused many to suffer serious losses, the self-help industry boomed as a result. Many adults at the peak of what should have been their earning potential were losing their jobs, homes, and facing unsure futures. They were seeking answers, and coaches, gurus, and motivational teachers were all positioned to fill this need. On a personal note, I lived in California during both the tech boom and bust years, and I worked for a technology search firm. I saw young people just out of college earning astronomical sums that afforded them the opportunity to do just about anything they wanted to during the boom years. They purchased multi-million dollar homes, $100,000 sports cars, took expensive trips, and owned the best of everything. After the bust, reality set in, but many of these young people still had money in the bank, sometimes receiving severance packages after losing their jobs. Some downsized or moved home with parents and planned their next move. Some returned to school to get an advanced degree or more training. Others started their own businesses or relocated. Still others spent their time and money on self-help programs, seminars, and retreats, hoping it would help them learn what they'd done wrong the first time around and guarantee future success. Self-appointed gurus, including James Arthur Ray, were in the position to take advantage of the opportunity to be the next Tony Robbins or Deepak Chopra, heroes of the self-help New Age movement. Ray just knew that this was his destiny. Two months after Ray received his epiphany on Mount Sinai, he was invited to attend a meeting of the Transformational Leadership Council, made up of leaders from within the fields of personal and professional development. While there, he was interviewed by Rhonda Byrne, a television producer from Australia. His interview would make up part of her project titled The Secret. Ray was not compensated for his interview but it opened the doors to worldwide exposure on The Today Show, Larry King Live, and Oprah. Ray could and would bookmark his life as before Oprah and after Oprah. After his second appearance on The Oprah Winfrey Show, Ray was asked to appear on national television and radio programs to talk about the keys to success. He didn't blatantly state that his programs guaranteed financial success, but instead claimed to help those who followed his principles to break through every barrier to their success, whether that be emotional, spiritual, financial, or in any other area of life. Ray's seminars began to sell out, and the prices for his programs increased. He added levels that claimed to take followers to new pinnacles of success, for a price, of course. The Harmonic Wealth Program was just the beginning. A curious person could attend a free informational talk and then would be offered a special rate to attend Harmonic Wealth for a couple of hundred dollars. The prices of the more advanced programs went up from there. The second level was Creating Absolute Wealth, which then qualified you to attend Quantum Leap. Graduates of Quantum Leap were invited to join Ray's World Wealth Society for a price of over $100,000 per year. Ray began speaking at stadium-sized venues, including before an audience of over 14,000 in Canada in 2008. He signed a book deal to publish Harmonic Wealth, for which he reportedly received a seven-figure advance. He continued to be a frequent guest on talk shows, and his star continued to rise along with his net worth. But in 2008, the U.S. economy took its biggest hit in decades when the bottom fell out of the housing market. Banks began to fail, and many people lost their homes, pensions, and life savings. Ray also began to feel the pinch. He was making millions, but his overhead costs were enormous. Each one of his events cost him the neighborhood of a quarter million dollars to produce, and he had dozens of people on staff just at James Ray International headquarters alone. He also had to pay the salaries for staff across the globe who helped run the dozens of seminars, lectures, group meetings, and other events each month. Ray would later report that it cost approximately $6 million per year just to break even. And now, with another bigger downturn in the economy, 
tickets began to go unsold and seats unfilled at his events. This may have led to the decision to offer a special deal to his followers in the fall of 2009. Ray's success pyramid consisted of six levels, starting with harmonic wealth, creating absolute wealth, quantum leap, after which followers could advance to more intense and spiritually focused levels of the program, practical mysticism, and modern magic. Once they had graduated from these five levels, they were only then allowed to attend the most intense top-level training, a six-day retreat called Spiritual Warrior. This retreat included aspects of deep psychological and mental work coupled with extreme tests of physical strength, all designed to push followers to, quote, play full on, unquote. Ray explained that more challenging tests would be required of participants in order to help them break through psychological barriers that had been holding them back from reaching their full potentials. During the Spiritual Warrior Retreat, Ray told them they would be challenged to, quote, do whatever it takes, no matter how uncomfortable or frightening it may be, because only those who are willing to go too far will discover how far they can go, unquote. In the fall of 2009, Ray made a one-time-only offer. He would allow attendees of his Harmonic Wealth Seminar to skip the other four levels and go straight to Spiritual Warrior by attending a six-day retreat to be held in October at Angel Valley Spiritual Retreat, a ranch near Sedona, Arizona. The retreat would cost $9,600 per person, and about 60 people signed up to attend, netting Ray over a half a million dollars for the event. Ray had held a Spiritual Warrior Retreat before, but previous attendees had gone through all five levels of his program, gradually participating in the increasing levels of physical and mental discomfort. This was all part of Ray's spiritual transformation program. Previous participants had also been told in advance what they could expect. This new group was only told that they were expected to play full on and would have to do whatever it takes in order to be transformed at the end of the retreat. On day one, the group was told their first challenge was to have their heads shaved, men and women. This would help them to let go of their dependence on external validation and focused on their spiritual selves rather than their physical beings, Ray explained. It would also be a tangible sign that they were fully committed to the program. Some of them, especially the women, wept in humiliation as their hair was shaved off, but they submitted. Next, they were required to play the Samurai Game, something, it said, that Ray created after seeing the Tom Cruise film, The Last Samurai. Ray played the part of God, complete with white robes, while his staff dressed up as angels of death in black costumes. Each participant was told they must, quote, kill themselves in the way of the samurai, unquote. And forgive me, I've never seen the movie, but I assume it required the use of simulated swords? Once they were dead, they had to lie still on the ground for some length of time. It was said to be psychologically challenging, as well as physically uncomfortable and even painful, after what turned out to be a lengthy amount of time before they were allowed to move or get up. Ray's teaching was that you must die to your old self and old limitations before you could be reborn and live your life full out. Without this step, he told his followers, they would be forever stuck in their limiting beliefs and never reach their true potential. Next came a more grueling challenge, something Ray called Vision Quest. Participants were sent out alone in the desert, where they were to spend the next 36 hours. They were not to take any food or water with them, but to fast and meditate by going deeply inside their own consciousness and rooting out any remaining obstacles to their spiritual enlightenment. But it was when they returned to camp to regroup and partake of a meal of vegetables and water that the last and most extreme test was revealed, the sweat lodge. The sweat lodge is a ceremonial practice often associated with indigenous peoples, but performed by several cultures. Ray claimed that his sweat lodge ceremony was based on Native American practices. In a typical Native American sweat lodge ceremony, leaders are monitored by tribal elders. All undergo extensive training in the spiritual and safety aspects of the sweat lodge ritual before they are allowed to conduct it. The sweat lodge is typically conducted inside a low domed hut. Participants sit in a circle inside the hut where heated rocks are placed in a pit in the middle. Water is periodically poured over the rocks, creating steam. Typically, participants pray while in the sweat lodge 
and this sacred ritual is used for purification. Participants usually remain inside the sweat lodge for a predetermined amount of time, and temperatures can reach 150 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit. After between 15 to 40 minutes, depending on the temperature, participants exit the lodge to cool down before returning for the next round. Ray wanted his sweat lodge ceremony to be the last and most extreme test the spiritual warrior group would be subjected to. To this end, he told his staff that he wanted the temperatures to be even hotter than normal and the lodge to hold a larger group. He enlisted a Native American tribal member to design the lodge to hold 75 people. The man explained that a typical lodge would be designed to hold only up to about a dozen people max, but there were approximately 60 people attending the retreat, and Ray needed enough room for all to participate. When the group was told about the sweat lodge ceremony, many were surprised and not very pleased. They had just undergone 36 hours of fasting in the intense heat of the desert and were already feeling depleted. This seemed like too much, and some didn't feel they could handle it. Ray told them that they should listen to their bodies and anyone could leave if necessary, but if they didn't complete the ceremony, they weren't playing full on and would miss out on this once-in-a-lifetime experience to really discover what they were capable of. He encouraged them, saying that he believed in them and they should believe in themselves. You can do this, he told each of the 50 people who entered the sweat lodge, clapping a hand on their back or shoulder while they stooped to enter the hut. Before the skeptical group entered, Ray told them, quote, You are not going to die. You might think you are, but you're not going to die. That's just your body reacting, unquote. He reminded them that people grow through challenge and told them that they needed to surrender to death to survive it. They were going to experience a symbolic death, he told them, then a rebirthing. Fifty participants entered the small domed hut that was made from a wooden frame and covered with tarps and tent materials. It was dark and hot inside. The only exit was one tent flap that was also closed. The area wasn't large enough for one large circle to be formed, so two rings of people were formed, shoulder to shoulder, with the second circle sitting with their backs almost against the row of people behind them. The body heat and close proximity to one another made the space even more stifling. About 2.30 p.m., the ceremony began. From the beginning, people were struggling. The door flap let in very little air, and those furthest away from it had trouble breathing. Ray kept asking for more hot rocks to be placed in the pit. When the flap was lifted for more rocks to be passed in by staff members was the only time fresh air entered. Ray had positioned himself closest to the door. Very hot sweat lodge ceremonies typically use 30 stones for maximum heat. A ladle is then used to apply water to the stones, creating steam inside the lodge. Ray had asked for over 100 stones to be positioned in his lodge and continually asked for them to be replenished. The temperatures reached an estimated 200 degrees. Also, instead of ladling water onto the stones, Ray's staff was instructed to dump the water straight from the buckets onto the rocks. Ray was observed ladling water on himself to cool off. The heat and humidity were unbearable. After the first round, people were allowed to leave the hut to cool off, but were asked to soon return to their places. A dozen people declined to return for another round. Some left weeping that they were letting Ray down. Ray stood outside, encouraging others to return, saying, You can do this. Some did re-enter the tent. One woman who was crying and upset at disappointing Ray but said she couldn't return, was seen being pushed back inside the hut by staff members before another of Ray's employees, Debbie Mercer, intervened. Those who'd remained inside or had returned began exhibiting signs of heat stroke. With their body temperatures rising and no way to cool down, they experienced confusion and nausea before losing consciousness. Some who'd moved towards the door collapsed before reaching the outside and had to be dragged out the rest of the way. Soon, others who remained inside also began to pass out and had to be taken out by staff members and other participants. Still, Ray continued to ask for more heated rocks and told participants to challenge themselves to remain. It's possible that some, like the weeping woman, felt guilty and disappointed in themselves for letting their guru, James Arthur Ray, down. He told them that they could accomplish anything, and now they were proving to him and themselves that they didn't have what it took. 
Others may have wanted to stick it out because they'd paid almost $10,000 for this experience. Still, others may have been unable to think clearly and listen to their bodies, as Ray had suggested, because they were disoriented from heat stroke. It was at this time that staff members, and especially Ray, should have intervened for the safety of the participants, removed the tarps from the tent, and taken immediate action to help all of the members cool down and make sure they were okay. Instead, the rounds continued. Every 15 minutes, people were allowed to leave for air, while more hot rocks were placed in the pit. More water was dumped on them, creating a cloud of hot steam inside the pit. One participant said it was, quote, like breathing fire, unquote. One hour passed, and then two. One man, trying to leave the sweat lodge, lost consciousness and fell on the hot rocks. He came to when he felt the intense pain of burning on his arm. He was helped outside. A staff member who attempted to give him aid said, quote, his skin was gone, was just basically hanging off of his elbow, unquote. Even so, the man's mind was on returning to the lodge. He told the staff member he had to get in. He wasn't done. He was obviously not thinking clearly. Another man, growing delirious from heat stroke, began screaming hysterically, I don't want to die! I don't want to die! and calling out the names of his children. Ray, positioned by the door, was heard to mutter as the man passed him while exiting, where he collapsed, Buddy, you need to get it together, before exclaiming to the group, it's a good day to die. Some interpreted this to mean dying to self, which Ray often spoke of. Two hours had passed by the end of the eighth round. One woman, 38-year-old Kirby Brown, was unconscious inside the tent. When Ray was told that a woman had collapsed inside and could not be roused, he reportedly said that they would, quote, deal with that after the next round, unquote. She had to be carried out minutes later, along with another unconscious man, 40-year-old James Shore. Shore was reportedly holding Kirby's hand when they were both found unresponsive. Staff now became more alarmed, while Ray seemed to remain calm. He told some panicked members who were being helped out of the tent, it's no different from running a marathon. He continued to tell people who were leaving, you're more than this, you can do this. Staff wanted to call 911, but some others said not to because it would upset Ray. Finally, at around 5 p.m., someone made the call, and paramedics arrived soon after to absolute pandemonium. People were laying on the ground outside of the tent, barely breathing. Some were vomiting or screaming for help for themselves or others. Several were unconscious and not moving. First responders thought they had come upon a cult mass suicide and asked if drugs or poisons had been ingested by the group. Melinda Martin, a James Arthur Ray International staff member, was performing CPR on the unresponsive Kirby Brown. Ray had exited the lodge and been hosed down along with another staff member. He seemed 100% fine and calm, Martin recalled. He simply stared at her as she was working over Kirby, not offering to help, not offering to call for help, nothing, she said. When help arrived, there were still three people lying unconscious inside the lodge. They were pulled out, and paramedics worked to revive them. 49-year-old Lisbeth Newman began seizing and had to be rushed to the hospital. She would die nine days later of organ failure. James Shore would be pronounced dead on arrival at the emergency room. Kirby Brown had to be airlifted to Verda Valley Medical Center in Cottonwood, Arizona, but would also be pronounced dead on arrival. All had suffered organ failure as a result of heat stroke. Nineteen other people were hospitalized, suffering from hyperthermia. When authorities arrived to investigate how this tragedy had occurred, Ray had already left the premises. When they arrived at his room to question him, they found a note on his door saying that he was unavailable because he was in prayer and meditation. When police were finally able to find him, he had reportedly showered and was eating dinner. He only answered their questions briefly before flying back to California. Five days later, Ray was back on stage in front of another audience of paid followers. However, once it was reported that two of his followers were dead and one lay dying as Ray continued business as usual, he was harshly criticized. News of the sweat lodge deaths that occurred under the watch of the Oprah-endorsed guru was picked up and reported around the world. Two weeks later, Ray canceled a scheduled seminar in Toronto and announced he was postponing all future appearances. Wow. 
No one believed that James Arthur Ray wanted to cause the death of his followers, but a combination of recklessness, hubris, and greed were said to be his undoing. His response to the tragedy was also problematic. Was he in shock or denial as his followers began suffering serious effects from the sweat lodge ceremony? Perhaps. But critics would say that Ray should have known better and not been so surprised since this wasn't the first time his members had been hurt participating in his programs. There had even been one prior death. In 2008, at a seminar in Hawaii, several members broke their hands after being asked to punch through bricks as part of the day's activities. Ray had begun incorporating feats of unnatural physical strength that his followers were asked to perform as far back as the year 2000. They were encouraged to punch through plywood boards and bend rebar with their necks, to prove to themselves that they were capable of more than they could imagine. Injuries occurred often, and Ray did not employ medical personnel at these events. Nor did he hire a trained medical team at a sweat lodge ceremony, but would later say that a retired nurse was present that day. In 2005, there was another incident at a James Arthur Ray sweat lodge ceremony. After four hours in the sweat lodge, Daniel Fankuch, suffering from heat stroke, became violent and irrational. Ray refused to call 911, saying that Daniel was undergoing a transformational experience and should be left alone. When a staff member at the Angel Valley camp did call for help, Ray became angry and argued with her in front of other members. Van Kutch was administered IV fluids for hours at the hospital, but he later reported he'd never fully recovered from his experience and blamed this trauma for the loss of a successful career, a divorce, and eventual homelessness. Employees of Ray International would report other incidents at previous sweat lodge ceremonies where participants became irrational and disoriented. One woman even forgot her own name for almost an entire hour after leaving the sweat lodge. Others, when told of their irrational behavior, later could not recall any of it. Ray would later dismiss these incidents as part of the growth experience. Then in July 2009, only three months before the fatal sweat lodge incident, Ray held a Creating Absolute Wealth seminar in San Diego, California. Colleen Conaway, a 46-year-old woman from Minnesota who had attended Ray's seminars previously and become a devoted follower of his teachings, traveled to San Diego to attend. Her family spoke with her before she left for California and said she was excited and upbeat to participate in the seminar. She admitted that she'd spent a large sum, $15,000, to pay for a full course of future workshops and seminars with Ray, creating absolute wealth being only the first of several courses she planned to complete. As part of the San Diego seminar, group members were asked to complete a challenge. They were to play the role of a homeless person, complete with old and threadbare clothes and dirt and grease smeared on their faces and in their hair by staff members. They rode a bus into downtown San Diego, where they were dropped off at the Horton Plaza shopping mall. They were to experience what it would be like to be homeless for several hours on their own before they would be picked up to return back to the seminar room. Participants were told to leave all their money, credit cards, and cell phones behind. I can imagine that being asked to do this would have been very uncomfortable and even scary for most, not to mention possibly dangerous, particularly for the women. But Ray's followers were often told that they needed to experience discomfort in order to grow. It is unknown exactly how Colleen may have reacted to being asked to join in this challenge, but there are clues. For one, according to an account on the blog site Spirituality is No Excuse, she had not changed clothes but remained wearing her regular clothes into the city. Ray was also on the bus and rode with the group to the mall. While members spread out into the mall, Ray and his staff members ordered lunch in a nearby restaurant. The blog site, for which I placed a link in the show notes, lays out a timeline of the events as follows. At some time shortly after 1 p.m., the group arrived at the Horton Plaza Mall. At 1.43 p.m., Colleen Conaway climbed over the railing of the third floor of the mall and jumped or fell to her death. At 1.54 p.m., a James Ray International staff member tweeted, quote, Just witnessed a woman jump several stories down onto pure concrete. I gotta say it was disturbing. I'm sending her my love right now, unquote. A bizarre message, to be sure. Mall security arrived, followed by San Diego police officers who questioned witnesses, but there are no records of Ray's staff members giving statements. 
At 2.04 p.m., Ray, who was a constant tweeter, sent out this message, quote, Eating lunch with my dream team while CAW participants are having a life-changing experience, unquote. This was strange in its timing, since his staff member who had tweeted about seeing the woman fall 10 minutes earlier was eating lunch with him. No mention of the woman or concern that it might be one of the group. After that tweet, Ray didn't post another for more than four days, very unlike his usual activity on Twitter. Between 2 and 4 p.m., Colleen Conaway's body was taken from the mall and was registered at the morgue as a Jane Doe. Of course, she had no identification or cell phone on her as they had been handed over to Ray's staff members before the trip to the mall. At 4 p.m., the bus arrived to return group members to the seminar room. Ray had put one safety measure in place. Each participant was assigned a buddy and told they were not to get back on the bus without their buddy. But when Colleen's buddy reported her missing, she was told not to wait, but to get on the bus, and they would handle it. They then left without Colleen. Now here's the shocking part. We may assume that somehow Ray and his staff didn't realize that Colleen was the woman who'd been seen falling to her death in the mall. That's possible, even though after she didn't show up at the bus, you think someone would have checked with police to make sure it wasn't her. But the odd thing is that hours later, beginning about 8 p.m., Staff members began leaving voicemails for Colleen on her cell phone, asking her to call and let them know she was okay. But the staff knew that they were in possession of her cell phone that whole time. What? Very fishy indeed. You can hear the voicemail messages on the blog site. It was later reported by a Ray staff member that they were told if anyone asked about Colleen to say that she was fine and had decided not to return to the group. Finally, around 8.30 p.m., a Ray staff member called mall police to report one of their members missing. They were asked to contact the police who then told them that they had a body in the morgue that needed to be identified. Instead of someone going to physically ID Colleen, they faxed over her driver's license to the hospital. Around midnight, Colleen's family received the terrible call that informed them of their daughter's suicide. They immediately thought this had to be wrong. She told them of her future plans and the money spent for the advanced courses with James Ray International just before leaving for San Diego. They observed no signs that she was despondent enough to take her own life. She'd had no history of mental illness or depression, they pointed out. The blog site speculates that Colleen may have been criticized and suffered public humiliation by Ray before the homelessness exercise. This is mere speculation since it hasn't been reported anywhere that I'm aware of. But past attendees of Ray's seminars have reported being berated publicly by Ray for not playing full on. They were chastised for what he considered making excuses when they did not sign up for the next course or participate fully in seminar exercises. Because Colleen was found wearing her regular clothes, the blogger wonders if she refused to participate and may have become upset if she was publicly chastised by Ray. We may never know. It is known that Colleen rode to the mall on the same bus with Ray. What's also known is that neither Ray nor anyone on his staff ever reached out to Colleen's family. The rest of the seminar participants were also not informed of Colleen's death. That night, the rest of the group were treated to an end-of-seminar black tie dinner and dancing, while Colleen's still unidentified body lay in the morgue. It wasn't until after four months of investigation into the Sweat Lodge deaths that James Arthur Ray was charged with three counts of manslaughter for the deaths of Kirby Brown, James Shore, and Lizbeth Newman. Ray, through his attorneys, always claimed that he'd taken extensive measures to keep his participants safe and prevent any problems from arising. He also said that members were warned verbally and in writing about the dangers. It was an accident and although he was the person in charge and took responsibility, his lawyer said, Ray should not be held criminally responsible for an unforeseeable accident. During the investigation, Ray's qualifications were called into question, as were the claims he'd made about his training. He claimed that he'd completed three shamanic initiations in Peru, but that is unlikely, as each would have taken more than a decade of study before someone would be considered for this honor. 
His qualifications in Huna, the Hawaiian spiritual tradition, was also dubious. It was discovered that he'd taken four classes before becoming a practitioner, a decision that was met with his instructor's great disapproval. Many other of his so-called spiritual qualifications were completed through paid correspondence classes. He'd had no training in ceremonial sweat lodges. The trial lasted for four months, and the jury was not allowed to hear all of the past incidents of problems at Ray's sweat lodge ceremonies. He was found not guilty of manslaughter, but was found guilty of three counts of negligent homicide and sentenced to two years in prison. The families of his victims found this sentence ludicrous. James Shore's three young children would grow up without a father. Liz Newman had been a longtime follower of Ray's and had spent over $100,000 on his seminars. She had lingered in a coma for nine days before succumbing to organ failure, while Ray kept on selling tickets to his seminars. And Kirby Brown had been so excited by the possibilities Ray's programs promised that she'd even dragged her parents to one of his seminars. She'd fallen into a coma inside the sweat lodge, and Ray had told a staffer that they'd deal with it later. While they couldn't change the sentence, Kirby's parents, Ginny and George Brown, sued Ray for negligence, fraud, and wrongful death. They ended up sharing a $3 million settlement with the other victims' families that was paid through Ray's insurance carrier. The Browns now worked to spread the word about the dangers associated with the $11 billion unregulated self-help industry and advocate regulations on these businesses that will, among other things, hold practitioners accountable for any harm that's caused. The state had asked that James Arthur Ray serve nine years in prison, but he was sentenced to only two years for each of his victims, which the judge allowed him to serve concurrently. Ray was released from prison after less than two years in July 2013. Four months later, he made appearance on The Piers Morgan Show to announce his re-entry into the self-help game. While Ray says he takes responsibility for the deaths at the sweat lodge, he still doesn't quite seem to connect the dots. From my observation of his many interviews since his release from prison, including a documentary film released in 2016 that details his career, the tragedy in Sedona, and his subsequent imprisonment and release, Ray keeps the focus on himself and his own suffering. Pain is the mother of all growth, he says. He goes on to say, It really has been so horrific in so many ways, and it's so painful. And yet, I'm incredibly grateful, because I've learned so much. I've grown so much, and it gives me an opportunity to help people in a deeper way than I was ever able to do before. While saying he takes full responsibility, some of his language borders on victim-blaming. He describes his conviction as, quote, the first time in history that consenting adults participating willfully in a legal activity where an action occurred and it was prosecuted as a crime, unquote. This is the message he shared with his first seminar audience at a Harmonic Wealth seminar he conducted nine months after his release from prison. He quickly followed this statement up with, that doesn't matter, I'm responsible. His interviews rarely mention the victims, and he doesn't call them by name. In an interview with Fox 5 in San Diego, he said this, It's been tough, and I understand that other people have been harmed and hurt by it, as well emotionally, as well as three people that lost their lives, and it did happen on my watch. He uses a lot of I's and me's and my's in these statements. He goes on to say, I don't expect the families to forgive me. I've apologized. I've taken absolute responsibility. I've paid a tremendous price. I've taken care of everything that the law and the government asked me to do. All restitution has been settled. So, you know, I'm sorry is not enough. I understand that and I'm not sure what else I could really do. Apparently, what James Arthur Ray thinks he should do is continue as a self-help teacher. He has resumed conducting his seminars and even wrote a new book in which he gives his version of the tragedy and its aftermath, on his own life, of course. He segues into promoting the book in this cringeworthy statement when asked to comment on his conviction. It was my lodge. It was my event. It was my choice to do a dangerous activity, and so therefore, as a leader, which the new book The Business of Redemption is all about leadership, as a leader, when something goes wrong in your business or your corporation, there's one person in the crosshairs and one person who is responsible. 
Finally, in the documentary Enlighten Us, his final statement about the sweat lodge deaths is this. It had to happen. It was the only way I could learn and grow. It was a test of character, a test through fire. For his next seminar in Las Vegas, Leadership for the Future, he is charging $3,000 per seat. That's a discounted rate for the seminar, limited to 10 people. The original price was $16,000. So, is James Arthur Ray a misguided teacher, a madman, or worse? Perhaps none of these. There may be a special category set aside for those who I believe start off with good intentions, but then get caught up in their own hype when money and status begin to increase. I think Ray started out truly believing he could and should help people. I think he believes that still. I also think he came with his own psychological baggage that contributed to his need to constantly have his ego fed by adoring followers. He grew up watching the respect, love, and attention that was bestowed upon his father by his congregation. He often spoke and wrote about feeling like he was never quite good enough for his own father. His mother, who he describes as strict, also expected a lot from her children, but lavished praise on her sons, James especially. She always told him he was special, that he had a calling and a purpose, and he embraced that prophecy. But the religion of his father did not appeal to him, so he set about in search of spirituality, and also financial success. He was embarrassed by his modest upbringing and vowed to be wealthy. He often spoke to his followers about his goal of becoming the first self-help billionaire. I think, in part, it was his trying to merge spirituality with wealth that led him to take unnecessary risks. First, his pursuit of great wealth resulted in his need to make more and more extreme claims, which would justify the high prices he charged for his programs. On top of this, his claims of being a spiritual enlightened guru made it difficult for him to admit mistakes or otherwise confess to not being an expert on things like sweat lodge ceremonies or the emotional fragility of members who may follow blindly to their own detriment. Ray also exhibits some narcissistic character traits, most disturbingly, his lack of apparent empathy towards his victims and their families. Like the old adage goes, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. Not all nicely packaged products or programs are all they're cracked up to be. I'll give you one more saying, this one from my dear old dad. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Cynical? Perhaps. But it's always served me well. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. You can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. There, you will receive one bonus episode each month. There are already 15 bonus episodes available for Patreon members, as well as updates, bonus videos, announcements, and sneak previews of upcoming episodes. Join us there and become a member for as little as $2 a month. Thank you to all our current patrons. You help keep the lights on and the stories coming week after week. I'll be doing a live show on July 21st in Campbell, California at 23 Skidoo Vintage and Retro Clothing Store. I'll be presenting a case of a lesser-known serial killer who hunted his victims right here in my hometown of San Jose, California. For more information and to purchase tickets, go to our Facebook page. There's a link in the show notes. Also, I was invited on one of the True Crime Guys Patreon bonus episodes, and you can listen to that now. Michael, one half of the True Crime Guys team, puts out a weekly bonus episode on their Patreon page called Higher Thoughts with Michael. I was a guest this last weekend, and if you're a patron of that podcast, you can listen to that episode and a whole bunch of other bonus episodes of the True Crime Guys. Check it out. You'll learn some little-known facts about me and hear us talk about a whole range of subjects, including some upcoming true crime projects I'm working on. Go to patreon.com slash truecrimeguys to become a member. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. I'll be back next week with another chapter of Deadly Therapy with a whole new case. Until then, have a safe and sane 4th of July if you're in the States, and be good to one another.